Good evening all and welcome. Tonight I have a collection of haunted hotel stories for your listening pleasure. I hope you enjoy. But for now it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I used to volunteer several times a year at a religious retreat, and on one occasion I travelled a considerable distance to get there. As a result, I was granted accommodation in the oldest section of a building that had been standing for centuries. After a long day of travelling, I arrived fairly late in the evening and was completely exhausted and promptly collapsed into bed, kicking off my shoes without a second thought. To my surprise, I woke up abruptly around three in the morning to the sound of a woman's voice near my ear. Her accent was distinctly broad Yorkshire. Still groggy and not fully coherent, I mumbled the response indicating that I was fine, but within seconds, my drowsiness vanished as I found myself sitting up in bed with all the lights in the room switched on, a flood of questions racing through my mind. What had just happened? The next morning as fate would have it, I encountered a staff member who had known me for years. Naturally, they inquired about my journey and how I fared. I recounted the details of my uneventful trip, but couldn't resist mentioning the strange occurrence from the previous night. Surprisingly, the staff member immediately asked which room I had stayed in, and upon revealing the room number, they responded with a knowing expression, revealing that that particular room was always the last to be rented out when the rest of the guest accommodation was fully occupied. Throughout my time at this retreat, I had encountered numerous other peculiar experiences. However, this one in particular has left a lasting impression on my memory. I used to work at the prestigious hotel Barnsley Garden, which is considered the number one resort in Georgia. The place has a haunting backstory involving the Barnsley brothers, where one of them tragically murdered the other. They've turned the house where the incident occurred into a museum, preserving the very spot where his blood stained the floor. Although I'm not a believer in ghosts, I had an encounter that left me questioning my skepticism. While I was working in the kitchen one day, a man entered and simply stood there, seemingly lost in thought. Puzzled, I asked if he needed assistance, but he remained silent, his gaze fixed on me. Feeling uneasy, I decided to step out of the kitchen briefly to find someone else to help. However, when we returned, the man had vanished without a trace. It was an inexplicable disappearance that left me perplexed. At a later time, I visited the museum dedicated to the Barnsley Brothers' story, and as I strolled through, I happened to glance at a large portrait hanging on the wall, and my jaw dropped in disbelief. It was the very same peculiar man I had encountered in the kitchen. An eerie sensation of cold chills swept over me, causing goosebumps to appear all over my body. I couldn't comprehend what it meant or how to make sense of it, but the image of that man's face stayed imprinted in my memory, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I had stumbled upon something inexplicable. Driven by curiosity, I searched for more pictures of him within the house, hoping to find some confirmation or perhaps a different appearance that would explain my experience. To my astonishment, the pictures I found only reinforced my belief that this was indeed the same man. The encounters and the stories I heard about Barnsley being haunted suddenly began to align in my mind. Perhaps against my prior beliefs, there was some truth to the haunting tales surrounding Barnsley Gardens. Back in 1985 and 86, my friend and I experienced something unforgettable. We were working summer jobs at an old retreat in North Carolina mountains, along with around 50 other young adults. The place had a mix of modern buildings, but the focal point was a grand white structure constructed in 1912. The building in many ways seemed to be an extension of the surrounding mountains, utilizing materials from its immediate surroundings, including trees, rocks and boulders for its foundation. With three stories plus a basement and an attic full of bats, the building had a unique character. Each evening, it was a fascinating sight to witness the bats pour out from the attic. At the front of the building, there was a magnificent portico adorned with three stories of white columns, offering an awe-inspiring view of the majestic smoky mountains from the collection of rocking chairs. 
However, it was the back of the building where we carried out our work. Two large wings formed a U-shape, hugging the rear of the building. To access our housekeeping facilities, we needed to use a fire escape that led directly to the second floor rear entrance, a single green metal door that I had become well acquainted with during my three summers in the housekeeping department. It was a substantial heavy door, with a pull handle on the outside and a push bar on the inside. Despite fire regulations requiring it to remain closed at all times, we would prop it open during the day with a bucket of water, disregarding the rules in the sweltering summer heat. A few nights before we were set to leave, while cleaning out the dorms and trying to turn the occasion into a celebration, we ran out of cleaning supplies. At around 9 o'clock at night, my best friend and I lazily decided to drive down to the back of the building to fetch more. Although the distance was short, we preferred to avoid walking up the steep incline. I parked my car directly in front of the stairs, and as we stepped out, an odd feeling began to creep over us. The air was still and stuffy, and an overwhelming sense of being enveloped by the building took a hold as we stood amidst the massive wings. With the entire building engulfed in darkness, locked up for the winter shutdown, we felt an eerie presence. Earlier in the day, my friend had been with me when I locked the door at the top of the stairs. As we ascended the steps, we found a sense of oppression settling upon us, causing both of us to halt. I expressed my fear, as my friend admitted to feeling the same. It was an unfamiliar sensation, as I had spent plenty of time alone in that building, exploring its basement and attic. We hesitantly pressed forwards, taking a few more steps, when suddenly, I experienced an icy chill coursing down my spine. I know it may sound like a cliché, but I can assure you, I have never felt anything quite like it before or since. It was as if someone had dragged an icy cold object along the length of my back. Finally, we reached the top of the stairs, and the moment I set foot on the landing, the door swung wide open, revealing the short entrance bathed in the eerie red glow of the exit sign. It beckoned us inside, but there was no sense of welcome, only an overwhelming feeling of dread. In fact, I can honestly say that I have never been more terrified in my entire life. Even now, 37 years later, just thinking about it sends chills down my spine. We both stood there, stunned for what felt like an eternity, trying to process the inexplicable event that had just unfolded. Eventually, the shock wore off, and I couldn't contain my fear any longer, and I erupted into an incoherent scream, panic overriding any rational thought in a state of utter terror. I hastily descended the steps, taking far more than necessary in my hurried descent. My friend followed suit, and together we ran up the steep incline, yelling and screaming, leaving my car behind in the process. The commotion attracted the attention of everyone else at the retreat, and they joined us in searching the building. As expected, the building was empty, and upon reaching the door it was tightly shut and secured. There was no way someone could have pushed open the door and escaped without us hearing them. The floors creaked loudly with every step, and any attempt to run away would have created a commotion. I have analysed the incident from every possible angle, but even after all these years I still have no rational explanation for what happened that night. I was staying at a charming B&B that had once been the lavish mansion of a lumber baron dating back to the early 20th century. My room was located on the ground floor, originally serving as a parlour or library for the esteemed owners. The current owners of the B&B, a warm and friendly retired couple, took great care of the place. However, there was an air of history and mystery that lingered within its walls. One night as I slumbered peacefully, I suddenly awoke with a start, overcome by a distinct sensation of someone firmly gripping my ankle. It felt as though a hand had wrapped itself around my leg. Startled and shaken, I swiftly leapt out of bed, frantically switched on the lights, and to my surprise, there was no one else in the room. I found myself alone in the early hours of the morning, feeling a mixture of confusion and unease, convinced that sleep would elude me for the remainder of the night. I decided to make my way to the kitchen, and patiently awaited the awakening of the household. At around 4.45, just as the first rays were peering down through the windows, the telephone rang and the answering machine picked up the call. 
It was the voice of the mother, who was in hospice care nearby, urgently requesting her daughter's presence. The B&B owner's apartment was located at the rear of the building, and they would not have heard the phone ring, as the call had come through the B&B's public number, separate from their private line. Realising the significance of the call, I knocked on their door, rousing them from their sleep, and informed them that an important message awaited their attention. Without delay, the daughter rushed off to be with her mother, who was simply feeling lonely and seeking companionship. Tragically, the mother passed away not long after my departure. When the family gathered at the B&B to reminisce about the beloved matriarch, a wave of laughter erupted as they shared amusing stories that had brought joy to their lives. Suddenly, in the midst of the laughter, a wire wall art sculpture hanging on the wall began to jangle and vibrate, as if someone were gently strumming it. The B&B owners recounted this eerie incident to me during my subsequent visit, and from that point forward, I made it a point to stay exclusively in the upstairs rooms, allowing the spirit of the mansion to rest undisturbed in its past, preserving the memories and stories that were woven into its very foundation. During our visit to the historic Columns Hotel in New Orleans, my mother, girlfriend and I stayed in a room to immerse ourselves in the vibrant atmosphere of Mardi Gras. As we settled in for the night, my mother decided to wake up early to catch the parade route, leaving my girlfriend and I in the room. With limited sleeping arrangements, I opted to sleep on the floor while my girlfriend and mother occupied the beds. As the night progressed, something peculiar happened. My girlfriend turned to me and asked if I had touched her during the night. Both of us were certain that my mother hadn't done so either. Confused, I reassured her that neither of us had made any physical contact. She proceeded to recount an unnerving experience. She had felt a hand stroking up the side of her leg, reaching all the way to her crotch. What made it even more perplexing was the fact that the covers hadn't shifted or moved ruling out the possibility that either of us had been the cause of this unsettling situation. This encounter left us questioning the nature of the room and the presence we felt within it. The historic ambience of the Columns Hotel took a more mysterious and enigmatic aura, making us wonder if there was otherworldly forces at play during our stay. When I was around 18 or 19, a group of friends and I decided to explore an abandoned hotel located near the seafront of my hometown. The hotel had been dormant since the 90s when a fire had ravaged the top floor. The only way to enter the building was through a broken window that led into a kitchen. As we entered, we were greeted by a scene of complete destruction. The kitchen appeared as though it had been trashed, with debris scattered everywhere. But undeterred by the chaos, we made our way to the main reception area, where the walls were covered with graffiti and doodles. While exploring, my friends and I descended into the basement, where we spotted a few orbs hovering in the darkness. Although it could have been dust or some other mundane explanation, they seemed larger and more distinct to me. Intrigued, we continued on with our exploration. As we approached the first floor, we encountered a door adorned with spray-painted pentagrams and nails protruding from the door frames. Initially finding it peculiar, we brushed it off and continued our adventure. My best friend's girlfriend and I decided to venture to the fourth floor where the fire had originated. The room that bore the worst of the damage left an eerie impression on us, and to our surprise we saw a figure standing in the room, sending shivers down our spine. Feeling unnerved, we quickly fled to the third floor. But that night, something unusual happened. I dreamt about the figure I had seen earlier, its face vividly imprinted in my mind. Although I didn't believe in the supernatural, the experience left me deeply unsettled. Later, as we headed downstairs to what would be the bar area to smoke some devil's lettuce, we discovered that the door previously nailed shut had been mysteriously opened. We hadn't noticed anyone entering or exiting the building, and curiosity got the better of us and we cautiously peered in. Our eyes fell upon a half-burned doll with the words, I'm watching you, scrawled on the wall. It sent a chill down my spine, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was profoundly wrong. As we sat in a booth trying to process what we had just witnessed, my brother, who shared my skepticism about the supernatural, suddenly mentioned seeing a woman in the corner. 
I looked up towards the door and saw a woman with long black hair and a pale face, her eyes fixated on us from the top of the doorway. Filled with a mix of fear and curiosity, I reached for my phone to capture the haunting image, but as soon as I grabbed it, she vanished into thin air. In the days that followed, I returned to the hotel, but nothing out of the ordinary occurred. The entire experience will stay with me for the rest of my days, as one of the most disturbing I have ever lived through. During a road trip with my dad to visit a college in Arizona, we passed through Santa Fe, New Mexico, and decided to stay at a motel there. The motel had a vintage charm to it, with various antiques displayed in glass cases. It seemed like a perfectly acceptable place to spend the night. After settling into our beds, something peculiar happened. I suddenly jolted out of bed, consumed by an intense surge of anger, as if I was ready to engage in a fight. Startled, I glanced towards the door and saw what I can only describe as a figure resembling a Dementor, its eyes fixated on me. My dad, who occupied the other bed closest to the door, calmly inquired about the commotion. In that moment, embarrassment washed over me, and I hastily dismissed the encounter as nothing more than a play of shadows. Convinced it was a figment of my imagination, I returned to bed, but not before catching a glimpse of the clock which read precisely 3am. The following morning, as my dad and I hit the road again, he initiated a conversation about the previous night. I recounted my experience, sharing the details of the Dementor-like figure. To my surprise, my dad disclosed to me that he too had seen something unusual. He described observing a man wearing a cowboy hat, intently staring in my direction when I had abruptly gotten up. My dad, typically a skeptic when it came to the supernatural, expressed his unease, adding further to the unsettling nature of the encounter. The incident left us both with a sense of bewilderment, unable to fully comprehend the nature of what we'd seen. The motel stay with its antique-filled ambience took on an eerie quality in retrospect. While we may never fully understand the true nature of the encounter, it remains an unsettling and thought-provoking memory from our trip through Santa Fe. A few years ago, three friends and I embarked on a vacation to a resort. On the third or fourth night, feeling a bit worn out, we collectively decided to skip the evening's festivities and hit the sack early. Me and my friend were roommates, and the other two friends occupied a separate room on a different floor. As I lay in bed on the verge of drifting off to sleep, I turned over and noticed my friend pacing around the room. Assuming he was engrossed in texting his girlfriend or simply restless, I didn't think much of it. He moved out of my line of sight, and I felt a slight sink in my bed. At that point, I figured he must be putting on his shoes, and despite the oddness of the situation, exhaustion prevailed, urging me to doze off. The next morning over breakfast, I casually inquired about my friend's whereabouts the previous night. To my surprise, he responded with confusion, stating that he hadn't left the room at all. Puzzled, I probed further, asking why he was walking around. He had revealed that he had mistaken those footsteps as mine. Considering the circumstances, it became clear that no one else possessed a key to our room. Yet both of us had witnessed someone wandering within our shared space. This inexplicable occurrence left us intrigued and somewhat unsettled, as we were left grappling with the mystery of the phantom presence that had seemingly shared our room that night. There was an abandoned hotel in a town called Marysville, California. In its prime, it was a bustling theater and hotel that housed prominent figures during the late 1800s to mid 1900s before going completely abandoned. My brother and his friends broke in one night and explored the 15-story building, and he told me about some of the things he found. As soon as they entered the hotel, they were greeted by an eerie silence that made them feel like they were being watched. They could hear their footsteps echoing through the empty hallways, and it seemed like every creak and groan of the building was magnified in the quietness. The first floor was relatively normal, with broken furniture and shattered glass scattered around, but as they made their way up, they started to notice something odd. The walls were covered in strange symbols and graffiti, some of which seemed to depict satanic rituals. As they reached the theater auditorium on the top floor, they were shocked to find a large pentagram drawn in the center of the room. 
The air was thick with the sense of foreboding, and they could almost feel a presence watching them from the shadows. Suddenly, they heard footsteps coming from the floors above them, and they froze looking at each other with terror in their eyes, as they knew they weren't alone. They decided to investigate the upper floors, but some of the doors were blocked off or locked, so they couldn't explore everything. As they made their way back down, they heard a blood-curdling scream coming from one of the rooms they passed. It was a woman's voice, but it sounded twisted and inhuman. My brother and his friends were scared out of their minds, but they kept going. Suddenly, they turned a corner and saw her. A naked woman, wild, covered in filth, with long matted hair and eyes that seemed to glow with madness. She was chasing rats and screaming at the top of her lungs. They didn't wait to find out what would happen next. They ran as fast as they could, trying to avoid the debris and obstacles in their path. They could hear the woman's maniacal laughter echoing through the halls as they ran down the stairs. As they burst out the front doors of the hotel, they looked back and saw the woman standing in the doorway, still screaming and flailing. My brother and his friends have never been more relieved to be outside in the fresh air and away from that terrifying place. They knew they'd never forget the horror that they had experienced that night. This happened last Wednesday night. Recently, my company started providing armed security for an old hotel under a new name and management in southern Colorado Springs. I don't know exactly how old this place is, but it has been an active hotel since I was very young. Well, as we started the contract, the standard for the first two months was to have two security officers working, one senior and one new. My last shift, I was paired with a really annoying rookie and this kid was uptight and dumb. For years, it's been known that many deaths, be it suicides, natural, or even a few instances of murder had occurred at this hotel. My concern was to make sure heavy drug users didn't sneak into the building and squat. The new kid, though, wanted to inspect everything from the littlest noise to anyone walking around after midnight to see if they were guests or not. Well, I think when we got called to the basement, it changed the kid's overly inquisitive nature, or just plain affected him. Front desk to security, the hotel radio chimed out. Go for security, I replied thinking it was another guest call complaining about their neighbor or a homeless person in the lobby. Can you both go check the basement? A motion sensor trip was sent from the front desk switchboard and I wasn't down there. You'll have to come get the key from the access stairs, the night auditor said. Thinking to myself that we have to get a key to access it, how can someone have gotten down there? So as we approached the front desk, the night auditor stated that the switchboard had gone off twice more since she called us, less than three minutes earlier. So curious, I asked, how could someone get down there without a key to the stairwell? They mentioned that the broken elevator isn't really broken, but it only goes from the first floor to the service area of the basement without the maid's key. She stated it like it was no big deal. Annoyed, I grabbed the key off the counter and told the rookie to look alive in case something went down there, knowing that bit of information. At the mouth of the basement behind the doors, we began hearing heavy moans and breathing that sounded like it could have either been directly behind the door or on the complete opposite side of the basement. I tell the rookie that before we go in to not do anything unless I tell them to and to stay on my six and follow. He nodded to show he understood, and I pushed open the door and announced, Security, if anyone is in here, announce yourself now. It's a standard procedure when we enter an area on most of our properties when we suspect a trespasser is present. The rookie followed him behind me, and as I proceeded, I noticed the safety lights were on every other fixture, so I didn't feel necessary to turn on the full lights since there was enough to see everything clearly. Towards the complete opposite side of the basement, we begin to hear what sounded like someone jingling a large key ring. My first thought was, oh joy, another meth head. As I began moving down the corridor, I heard the sound of the hood of a holster disengage. Pissed, I turned around to chastise the rookie for drawing his gun, but anger turned into confusion. He was standing there pale and fixed eyes forwards. Did you hear that? I replied that it might just be a machine switch but reminded him to follow my lead. 
Now thinking that there was someone at the end of the corridor in the main laundry, I unsnapped my taser latch just in case. As we approached the end of the basement to the other locked stairwell, we didn't find anything out of the ordinary or anyone trying to nest. But as we reached the freight elevator, we found a sign that set the next set of events in motion. A sign that read, Security, all elevator access to the basement will be unavailable overnight from the 1st to the 12th. If you need access, get the key from the desk. I took a picture to show the night auditor, but got a chill while doing so. As the rookie and I began to double check everything in the area on our way back to the stairs we came from, we started experiencing minor paranormal occurrences after the rookie found a few spiritual items. While still in the main laundry room towards the far back of the secondary stairs, the rookie found an unburned bundle of white sage wrapped in white lace, sitting on top of one of the large machines. Not knowing anything about sage, the rookie quickly snatched it off of the machine. Hey, I think I found a weird joint. I turned to see him holding a bundle of white sage. Put that down. It's not weed, it's cleansing sage. The kid didn't know anything about paranormal phenomena or how to protect against it, so I told him not to pick anything up, especially if it wasn't something he was familiar with. After he put it back where he grabbed it from, the first occurrence happened. As he set it down 20 feet behind him, a shelf filled with clean folded towels fell completely off the wall. As we documented it for a report, a small snigger came from further up in the corridor, but only like a split second. We began moving up to the next section, where the overstock furniture and appliances were stored. An overhead pipe that was not leaking when we passed under it earlier, was now leaking. Almost like there was a huge crack that had just happened. I thought it was odd, because I was sure with the amount of water leaking that we would have heard it regardless of our location in the basement. As I was inspecting the pipe for the point of the leak, the rookie yet again picked something up. Hey, this isn't sage, is it? I look at him, smelling Palo Santo wood, tied with a red ribbon. Dude, I reply exhausted. When he gets it, he drops it. I look down at the puddle of water from the leaking to see a bare footprint within the water. Starting to get freaked out, I said we needed to get back upstairs. We proceeded to get to the second to last section and immediately I noticed a cross sitting on the wall that I didn't spot earlier with lavender sage wrapped in purple lace. Take a quick look around and just make sure nothing's going on so we can go, I said, trying to not show that I was getting unnerved. Nothing happened in this section until before we moved through the double doors, with all the safety lights behind us and back to the laundry when they started flickering. Honestly thinking something was gonna happen, but not wanting to show that I was beginning to freak out, I told the rookie to move to the last room. Finally, the last area where we came from. Luckily, in here, there were only two small planning offices and the hub room. The difference between where we entered the basement till now was the light was on the inside of the hub room. I told the rookie to watch the hall as I checked the planning offices, which was quick. But when I went to the hub room to check and turn off the light, I looked down at the server monitor for the main cameras. In the hub room, it had the whole hotel cameras on this one monitor. Up at the front desk, the camera only showed the exterior, hallways of all the rooms and the pool areas, so I took a glance at the screen and noticed the lights were still flickering in the main laundry. A big pause in the lights occurred, and the night vision started to kick in. Slowly, a figure on the screen from the laundry became visible. I realized while intently staring that the figure was standing next to the machine that had the white sage on it. A bright flash lit the monitor as the light came back on. My heart dropped as the room lay empty. The person who was standing in the night vision of the camera was just gone. I looked at the door frame of the hub room to see a bundle of black sage nailed to the frame, wrapped in black twine. I walk out, closing the door behind me. We clear? asked the rookie. Still stunned by what I saw on the camera, I replied, We're done down here. We enter the stairwell and lock the door. Back in the lobby, the night auditor came over and asked if we found anything. I'm going to go out front for a smoke, then I'll show you the issue we found, I said, pulling the pack from my pocket. The auditor seemed knowing that I was startled and asked, You didn't touch the wards, did you? 
I looked her in the eye without saying a word. Oh dear, you did. It's been roughly a week since I've been there, and I can say I'm not looking forward to going back. I also found out this afternoon that the rookie I worked the nights with has departed the company. I wasn't told if he quit or was fired, but as of today he is no longer on staff. So I'm curious if he left because of what happened, or another reason. The casino and hotel where I work have a reputation for being haunted. We affectionately dubbed the friendliest spirit the Hello Ghost. She manifests as a middle-aged woman who simply wants to grab your attention. If you've been with the same company for some time, she may even call out your name like, Hey Elaine. If she doesn't know your name, she may settle for a general, Hello. Most of us respond with a greeting in return. During our shutdown, the managers stayed on as caretakers, although I can't confirm if it was our hello ghost, the general manager shared an experience with. He was heading to the bar for some coffee, when a middle-aged woman shouted at him, Hey, what are you doing? He had always dismissed our claims about the building being haunted, but this incident finally made him a believer. It was an eye-opening moment that set the tone for our welcome back meeting. There was an unmistakable sense of anger present in our cafe, although it's hard to pinpoint. The moment you cross the threshold when the cafe is closed is as if someone is screaming directly at your face. As you venture to the back kitchen, the anger lingers behind you. However, it completely dissipates when you reach the stairs leading to the basement storage area. To access the executive office, you must climb a flight of stairs and pass through a large conference room. Several employees have reported the eerie sensation of someone sitting in the corner quietly observing their every move. This feeling starts at the top of the stairs and abruptly vanishes once you step into the office space. One of the restrooms has a mischievous ghost that enjoys flushing toilets, dispensing paper towels and turning on faucets at random intervals. Despite recently hiring an external company to handle the maintenance of paper towel dispensers which are all new, the helpful ghost continues to make its presence known. One adorable employee even thanks the ghost for the paper towels right from the stall. The hotel, a small detached building with fewer than 10 rooms resembling a large house, has its fair share of supernatural encounters. Both guests and employees have reported being touched or pushed, hearing the sound of children running and laughing in the halls, finding bed linens disheveled after maid service, and witnessing televisions turning on by themselves. However, the most captivating story involves two managers. They both received calls from a room with a mains line, but upon answering it, they found themselves met with silence. All they could hear was the faint sound of an old radio broadcast playing in the background, reminiscent of an early 1900s news report. When they investigated further, they discovered that the room in question was unoccupied. Overall, these experiences aren't necessarily terrifying, but they certainly make for an incredibly strange and surreal environment to work in on a regular basis. This story happened to me around 20 years ago. I was living in the UK and it's the usual summer holiday ritual at that time. My parents booked an all-inclusive holiday to Lanzarote. The school year was finished and I was looking forward to many lazy days at the beach. Unfortunately, things seemed a little off from the get-go. When we arrived at the hotel, the staff seemed confused and told us they had no rooms reserved for us. At the time, when everything was done through travel agents and other travellers had no issues. After exchanging some very confused looks, the staff finally gave us a room, number 101. After being allowed to check in, my parents and I head straight over to the beach to catch some sun and start the holiday feeling. I'm an only child, and it was just me, my mum, and my dad. Now, my dad is the typical super cautious dad who will always check keys, wallet, glasses about three times before leaving the house. After barely five minutes of being at the beach, everything had gone missing. Sure, it's very possible that someone stole it from us, but it was later in the afternoon where there were very few people around. Now, most of the rest of the story comes from what my parents told me after the events. Believe me, my parents are not the type to invent stories. They are very much, if we don't see it, we don't believe it. Two days in, 
and my dad starts to suffer from extreme pain in his shoulder. He had to find a local clinic for a steroid injection, but also had difficulty sleeping at night. So I went to the main bedroom with my mum, and my dad stayed in the living room tossing and turning trying to sleep. According to my mum, every night at 3am, she would hear banging coming from the living room area. At first she thought it was my dad trying to tidy up after the day, but being clumsy about it. But after a few nights of being woken up by this banging, she decided to go and ask him to keep it down only to find him fast asleep on the sofa. Not just my mum had the strange experience. My dad did have a lot of trouble sleeping, and so would play Tetris on the Game Boy. One night, he was playing as he was unable to sleep, and he felt the room become very, very cold. He then heard footsteps walking in the room behind him. My dad, a well-educated, respected engineer, a man of science, was freaked out. He refused to look behind him and climbed onto the sofa and did not look back. There were various other instances that things happened. This last episode happened the night before we were due to leave, and is my own experience. I had been told to go pack my suitcase in my bedroom by my mum. I started folding my clothes when suddenly a rancid smell filled the room, a smell I had never smelt before, and to this day have not smelt since. Putrid. Rancid, rotting. I can't describe the exact words, but I ran out of the living room and asked my parents to come see if some pipe had broken. They came in, smelt it, and within 15 seconds the smell disappeared. My parents looked at each other and suddenly said in cheery voices, We can all sleep in the living room tonight, it'll be fun. I didn't question it, as it was a time when I just did what my parents asked. It was the middle of the night. I'm laying between my mum and dad on the floor of the living room, when I open my eyes and see a figure standing in the corner of the room. I say figure, but whatever it was was slightly blurry and brown, not particularly tall, but definitely humanoid in shape. I look at this figure for a few moments and then asked, Who are you? At which point I felt my mum lay her hand on my head and told me to go back to sleep. I know this is not a particularly scary story, but I wouldn't say I or my parents have any sort of sixth sense or sensitivity to these things. I also think that given the setting of a two week beach holiday, ghosts are not really something that come to the forefront of your mind. All I know is that there was some sort of presence in that small hotel apartment. Ghost or something different, who knows? I guess I just feel that, although science has supposedly disproved all these theories, there are definitely more things in the universe than we are currently aware of. I work in a hotel situated in a relatively newer building constructed in 2007. However, the plot of land where the hotel stands has a rich history. From 1880 until 2001, there was a grand theatre that operated until the 1960s and later transformed into a nightclub until its closure in the late 1980s or early 1990s. Since I started working here in December, I've heard various stories from fellow workers suggesting that the place might be haunted. Initially, I didn't pay that much attention to these tales as I hadn't personally experienced any notable energies except for two peculiar occurrences. In the lower ground area, there is a distinct pocket of coal where some guests have reported their room's televisions randomly switching on. Similarly, directly above the ground floor, I sometimes sense a momentary audio distortion akin to the sensation of submerging one's head underwater. However, as an empath, I haven't detected any strong emotional resistance, so I dismissed these phenomena as mere oddities. However, recent events have started to make me question my initial assessment. Last week, while reviewing security camera footage, my attention was drawn to an anomaly, an unidentified black shape moving across one of the cameras. This movement couldn't be explained by the typical glitches or malfunctions I often observe. When my colleague went to investigate if there was an insect or debris obstructing the camera, the unexplainable occurrence repeated itself. This incident prompted my colleague and me to discuss the possibility of the building being haunted. They asked for my opinion, and I shared my previous observations, emphasizing the absence of any substantial feelings or experiences. 
It was precisely at this moment when I expressed my skepticism that one of our handheld radios positioned next to my colleague unexpectedly admitted loud static despite being untouched on the desk. Reacting quickly, I grabbed the radio and turned it off. Strangely enough, my colleague who was sitting beside the radio complained of feeling as though someone had scratched his shoulder. Simultaneously, a mark appeared on his shoulder, coinciding with the radio's sudden burst of static. Within 48 hours of this incident, a long-term resident guest reached out to us, requesting a room change. Unbeknownst to her, since the event with the radio, she had encountered unsettling experiences in her room, including finding the bathwater running when she returned, the kettle turning on by itself approximately half hour later, unpleasant dreams and ultimately her baby's bottle sliding across the bedside table and falling off without any apparent cause. The accumulation of these events has deeply disturbed her to the point where she cannot bring herself to enter the room alone to retrieve her belongings. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's collection of haunted hotel stories. Certainly an entertaining one, at least for me. If you did, you know what to do down below. It is always very much appreciated. I would like to give an extra thank you to my members and patrons whose names can be seen on screen. There's extra additional members and Patreon content and videos now coming every other week. So if you'd like to get in on some exclusive Mort minis, where I tell about 10 to 15 minutes worth of obscure and unusual story topics, you can do that. But it's optional, of course, up to you. I think I'm going to wrap things up here though for now though. Thank you all again so much for watching. If you'd like more, there is some extra on screen now. But until next time, stay awesome and I will see you in the next one.